Welcome to the third introductory unit for Fundamentals of Deep Learning. Like the last unit, this unit uh, was designed to give people a taste of things that are going to be happening toward the middle of the class. I wanted everyone to get a preview of that. Also, uh, the content of this material I think is sufficiently important that it's good to see it once in the beginning and then uh, review it in the middle of the course. The next units are going to be more applied. We're going to start talking about frameworks and particular architectures, vision, natural language. But for this lecture, we're still staying at a quite abstract level. Um, why information theory? The fundamental equation of deep learning, or at least the one I'm billing as the fundamental equation of deep learning, involves cross-entropy, a cross-entropy loss. Cross-entropy is an information theoretic concept. So we're going to go through that concept from an information theoretic perspective. It's also true, however, that information theory plays a central role in many other aspects of deep learning, in variational autoencoders, in GANs. Um, so it's a good thing to be familiar with. And it's important to be familiar with it um, in this course, for the middle section of the course. The fundamental concept in information theory is the concept of entropy. So the entropy of a distribution is defined as the expectation over drawing an element of that distribution, an average, of the negative log probability of what the item uh, you drew. This is the population probability. Now, if I use a natural logarithm here, this entropy or this log probability has units of nats because I'm using a natural logarithm. Uh, it's more intuitive to, in information theory to use units of bits. Bits are sort of the standard, are a very familiar unit of information in computer science. We measure our MPEG files in bits, our, our disk capacity in bits. Everybody's familiar with bits. Um, so if I take log two of the probability, that just differs by a constant from the natural logarithm, constant factor, um, and then we get units of bits. Why bits? Bits are a measure of file length um, or the length of a bit string. So why is minus log two of a probability uh, a number of bits? Why is bits the right unit for that? Well, let's just consider an example. So let P be a uniform distribution on 256 values. If I take, um, if this is uniform, uniform distribution, if I take an average over drawing Y from the population of minus log two of the probability, the probability is just one over 256. So negative log two of one over 256 is log two of 256 equals eight. And intuitively, if I have a uniform distribution over 256 values, that means I can represent each value with eight bits. So we want to think of minus log two of the probability as the number of bits it takes to represent this item Y when we draw it from this distribution P. And there's a fundamental theorem it says this does not just apply to the uniform distribution, this applies to all distributions. So negative log two of P of Y can be interpreted as the number of bits it takes to represent Y when we use a code that's optimal for the probability distribution P. So let's, let's see if we, I'm gonna state this theorem, Shannon's source coding theorem, or at least a version of it. Um, first, I'm going to define the concept of a prefix-free code. So a code is going to map each element of, the, of a set Y. I love abstraction, so we're considering an arbitrary set Y. The code is going to map each element of this arbitrary set to some bit string. And it's prefix-free if no two codes or two elements of this set have the property that one is a prefix of the other. Now, the reason for that restriction is if I'm reading a sequence of codes, I need to know when one code stops and I get an item and the next code begins. 
If one code was a prefix of another, it would be an ambiguity in where it stops. So a prefix free code has the property that if I string codes together, I can decode that always into a sequence of elements of Y. So if we want to represent a sequence of elements of Y, we have to use a prefix free code. An example of this is a null terminated byte string. If you've got a file or a data structure string in C, um, typically it's terminated with a null byte. The sequences of null terminated byte strings are prefix free. You know when the, the string terminates because it's got a null byte. Okay. We're going to consider codes and um, we're going to consider the average code length. So we're going to consider drawing uh, elements of this set according to the probability distribution P and measuring their code length. So this is the average number of bits used if I'm sending a sequence of elements, if the elements are drawn from the probability distribution P. So this is how many bits it takes on average to send a sequence of elements of Y um, when you're drawing the elements from P. So we're gonna want the elements that have high probability to have low code length. Okay, so the version of Shannon's source coding theorem says, and we'll prove this theorem much later in the course, just um, as we pass through this again. The theorem says for any prefix free code C, the average code length cannot be less than the entropy of P measured with uh, log two in bits. So if we measure the entropy of P using um, log base two, this is a number of bits. This says that it's impossible for a code to do better than the entropy of P. Furthermore, there exists a code, there always exists a code if this is a, a discrete set and this is a probability distribution, there always exists a code such that the average code length is no more than, no more than the entropy measured log two, the number of bits according to the entropy, plus one. Um, because the, the entropy is defined in a nice smooth continuous function and codes have to be discrete, there's a kind of rounding slackness where you get this plus one. So this is saying that indeed this, ex this expression minus log two of the probability of y can be interpreted as the number of bits it takes to represent y. Okay, that's entropy. Entropy just involves one distribution. The, law, the, the fundamental equation of deep learning involves a cross entropy. So the idea behind a cross entropy is you've got one distribution you're drawing from so in machine learning, there's always a population and you're drawing from some population. You don't know any formula for the probability of the elements of the population. All you can do is draw them. They can be sentences, they can be images, they can be arbitrarily complex things. You can draw one, a sample, but you don't know what its probability is. You don't have access to that. So we're drawing from the population and then we have a model. And the model is going to, uh, a model is capable, a typical deep learning model, not all, but many, are capable of assigning a probability to the things we draw. So we're drawing from one distribution and taking minus log probability from a, another, a different distribution. So loving abstraction, the general definition is the cross entropy between any two distributions on the same set is you draw from the first and you take the log probability of the second. So in deep learning, the fundamental equation for the unconditional case, remember everything, everything you can do conditionally, you can do unconditionally and vice versa. And right now I'm focusing on the unconditional case where you're trying to model the, the probability distribution over English or images or something like that. It's called density estimation. Um, the fundamental equation we're dealing with is we want to set the parameters of the model so as to minimize this cross entropy. When we draw from the population and measure the probability according to the model. Now this also has a data compression interpretation, sort of like Shannon's source coding theorem. It's saying that this is how many bits it takes to represent one of these things. When we draw from the population, but use a code 
that's optimal for the model probability. Um, so this is defined in natural logarithm. So this, this um, can be interpreted as 1.44 times the number of bits needed to code when drawing from P and using the imperfect code from Q. 1.44 is the conversion factor um, from nats to bits. One nat is bigger than a bit. Okay, <clears throat> so we've done entropy. We've done cross entropy. Now we're going to do KL divergence. So here's, these are just the definitions we just saw. Here's the entropy. Here's the cross entropy, where we draw from one and take log probability of the other. The KL divergence can be written as the entropy, I mean, sorry, the cross entropy from P to Q minus the entropy of P. And um, you can just, both of these involve an average over drawing from P. So you can take these two averages from drawing from P and combine them into one average of drawing from P of the difference between these log probabilities. Um, and you get this expression, right? So this is another expression for the KL divergence. And we're going to show that the cross entropy is always greater than or equal to the entropy. Intuitively, the entropy is drawing from P and using a code that's optimal for P. The cross entropy is using a drawing from P and using a code that's suboptimal for P. So you get more bits uh, in the representation generated this way than in this way. So the cross entropy is always larger than the entropy. Now, if the cross entropy is always larger than the entropy, that's equivalent to saying that the KL divergence is always greater than or equal to zero. Okay, the universality assumption. This is something that's gonna come up a lot throughout the course. This is a crazy, unrealistic assumption that is very useful, it seems, empirically. Important things have been uh, motivated by this assumption uh, in spite of, the, of the, its craziness. It's clearly, it's clear um, in, invalidity. Okay, so, we're interested in this equation. We want to minimize the cross entropy from a population to a model over parameters of the model. We want to optimize the parameters of the model such that we minimize this cross entropy. And this entropy is, is always greater than, re, this cross entropy is always greater than or equal to the true entropy of the population. All right, we're going to assume this crazy assumption that the model can represent any distribution. So the model's capable of representing the population. That's a kind of, that's a universality assumption. There are models where you can prove this universality property, um, but it, this gets used, this assumption gets used all the time in analyzing things where that's not true. Finite capacity models with finite numbers of parameters um, cannot model any distribution. Um, or, or anyway, if the distribution is uh, sufficiently complicated, it can't model it. Um, but we're going to assume that this has within it the expressive power to model this distribution. And furthermore, we're going to assume that when our algorithm for optimizing this, the true optimization is intractable. So we're going to use gradient descent, typically, to try to optimize this. We're going to assume that the gradient descent algorithm finds the, the true representation of the population. All right, this is clearly false for deep networks, but it gives important in, insights. In particular, um, minimizing this cross entropy, this cross entropy can be written as the entropy of the population plus the KL divergence. And so the true optimum of this for the model when I, when I optimize the model, I don't affect this term. I only affect the KL term. And the true optimum of this is when the KL divergence is zero, because the KL divergence um, has to always be non-negative. And if these two distributions are the same, then the KL divergence is zero. So the optimum of this is when the model distribution equals the population distribution. So under the universality assumption, the, the optimal model, the model returned from a training algorithm is the population. 
And this is intuitively a rationalization for why this fundamental equation is a, is a good equation. Its optimum is the population. Now I've done this for the unconditional case where I'm just modeling a distribution. In the conditional case, we're modeling the probability of the label given some input, but the same theorem applies. Minimizing the conditional cross entropy, the, tr the true optimum of that is the population conditional probability of the label given the model. So this cross entropy objective, if optimized effectively, um, produces under the universality assumption, the population probability or conditional probability. Now it's important to remember um, that these things are asymmetric. So when I write cross entropy from P to Q, I'm sampling from P and measuring the probability from Q. And that's quite different from doing it the other way around. So in particular, if I sample from Q and measure, sorry, sample from P and measure a probability according to Q, Q had better assign non-zero probability to everything I can sample. If Q assigns a zero probability, the negative log Q goes to infinity and the cross entropy goes to infinity. So to make this cross entropy finite, the model has to assign non-zero probability to everything that P can sample, that everything that P assigns non-zero probability to. If I flip them, then the optimum in, to sample from when I, um, when I measure the probability according to P is simply selecting the single thing that has the largest probability according to P. So flipping these um, has a dramatically different um, outcome. It's, a, it's the, the asymmetry is important. Um, this also applies to KL divergence. Now KL divergence is zero when the two things are the same. And minimizing the KL divergence is the same as minimizing the cross entropy. Um, if, if we're minimizing the second term, if, we're minimi if we take the KL divergence in the other direction, so now the KL divergence is still zero only when these are the same. So the optimum here it, under a universality assumption is still going to be that, that this is going to be optimum when it's exactly P. However, uh, in this case, uh, in practice, this can focus, this can still focus more on um, the modes of P. This can be focused on places where P has high probability, and it can even be zero on places where, um, where P has probability. So this direction of the KL allows this to not cover all of the support of P. Um, and, and, and this is a case where the universality assumption kind of fails. Even though the optimum of here is P, in practice, this direction of the KL divergence does not typically yield that, what you want. Okay, we're gonna end uh, in a moment, um, but we're gonna end by proving uh, these claims I made that the cross entropy is always larger than the entropy and the KL divergence is always non-negative. And these proofs are done with Jensen's inequality. These are tools you really should be comfortable with, um, at least from taking this class. I want you to be comfortable with Jensen's inequality and manipulating information theoretic quantities. Um, so we're going to prove that the KL divergence is always non-negative. And we're going to do it by Jensen's inequality. What's Jensen's inequality? Jensen's inequality involves a convex function. Convex function is a function that's upward turning. Um, technically, if you take any two points on the function and consider the line between them, that line is above the function. That's what it means to be convex. In Jensen's inequality, you can sort of see it in this picture. If I take an average, an expectation of the function, so if I take an expectation of the function over a distribution between x and y, say, um, that expectation uh, will yield a value if I, if, um, if I take the point on here that is the expectation of um, the, the, the x value and look at the function at that point, 
the function at that point is going to be less than um, uh, the average of the function across the interval. So if I take the x, the average of the function, uh, if I take the average of the function, that's always going to be greater than or equal to the function of the average, and that's Jensen's inequality. So if I take the average of the function over this interval or over some space, it's always going to be larger than the function applied to the average. I'm not going to prove this. I'm just claiming this, but I'm going to use it. Um, so here I'm going to prove that the KL divergence is always non-negative. So here's the KL divergence. I we showed earlier that it's equal to the average over drawing from P of the negative log of the ratio of Q to P. Now negative log is a convex function. So uh, the, the Jensen's inequality says that the average of a convex function is always greater than or equal to the function of the average. So I've taken this expectation and I pushed it inside the convex function and it, um, and it gets smaller. So the KL divergence is always greater than or equal to minus log of the expectation of this quantity. The expectation of this quantity can just be written as the sum over Y of the probability of Y times the quantity. So now the probability of Y cancels and that's equal to the sum over y of the q probability of y. But q is a probability distribution, so it sums to 1. And negative log of 1 is 0. So there's a, if you, from Jensen's inequality, there's a very simple proof that the KL divergence um, is always non-negative. Now, later in the course, when we get to variational autoencoders and the elbow and lots of stuff, we're going to be proving lots of um, or noting lots of equations between information theoretic quantities. What we just did, um, this, this um, well, let's look at the KL divergence again. So the KL divergence has this form. Um, uh, and what I'm going to do is note that this log of this ratio can be broken down into two terms, right? The log of a, of a ratio is a difference of logs. So this expression can be written as minus log Q minus minus log P. So if I rearrange, if I take this log and break it down into a difference, then I can take each term in that difference and write it as a corresponding information theoretic quantity. So I'm taking this log and I'm breaking it um, into two pieces just by taking the log of a difference. And then these two pieces I can write as, I can take this expectation, and since this is a difference, I can push this average to be the average of the first term minus the average of the second term. The average of the first term is just a cross entropy, and the average of the second term is just an entropy. So the point here is that I can take an expectation in general, I can take an expectation over drawing from a distribution of a log of a product of terms and write that as an expectation of a sum of logs. And that often lets you rewrite something, um, rewrite one information theoretic quantity in terms of others. This is going to happen in, when we get to mutual information. So here's the summary. Um, we have uh, cross entropy, unconditional cross entropy. We have uh, the, the um, unconditional fundamental equation, how we optimize um, cross entropy for doing density estimation. We have conditional cross entropy loss. So the unconditional form, the conditional form. We have these definitions of, the, of three fundamental information theoretic quantities, entropy, cross entropy, and KL divergence. Um, and we have these facts that the cross entropy is always greater than or equal to the entropy, the KL divergence is always non-negative, and the argmin over the second argument of a cross entropy is the first argument. And this justifies the fundamental equation that I, I've talked about earlier. Okay, the next unit will move on to frameworks and writing code. So we're gonna be in a different place the next unit. Thank you.